Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar, Cybersecurity for Control Systems and Process Automation, co-hosted by ISA and Siemens. I'm Rob Briner with ISA and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items to go over and I also want to let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, poll questions and the question and answer session. There will be four poll questions within this webinar. When the poll questions pop up, please enter your answer into the poll feature on the right-hand side of your WebEx window. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To submit your questions, type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please do not use the chat toolbox for the Q&A session. If you have any miscellaneous questions for me, you may submit those using the chat toolbox. If we do not get a chance to respond to your question or if you would like to discuss a topic in more detail with the presenters, please feel free to contact them directly. Their contact information will be provided at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you that just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions, again, please refer to the confirmation email sent out to you today. Or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you will see a tab labeled Event Info. Connection instructions are included there as well. Additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. Please take a few minutes to fill out this survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. All right, let's get started. Allow me to introduce our presenters. Our first presenter is Eric Cosman. Eric has over 35 years of experience in industrial information technology and over 15 years in ICS cybersecurity at the company, sector, national, and inter international levels. Eric is a founding member and co-chair of the ISA 99 Committee and a past Vice President of Standards and Practices at ISA. He is also a current member of ISA's Executive Board and a former leader of a chemical sector cybersecurity program. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Also joining us today is Robert Thompson, Product and Solutions Security Officer with Siemens. Robert has over 10 years of experience in the automation field. He is active in all areas from factory automation to process automation regarding the security needs of customers, addressing a wide range of topics from secure remote access and industrial security monitoring to endpoint protection and IEC 62443 assessments. He currently has the responsibility of Product and Solutions Security Officer for Siemens Plant Security Services, which ranges from risk analysis, vulnerability handling, and security trainings. Welcome, Robert. Thank you very much. And now I will turn things over to Eric to go over our agenda and get started with today's webinar. Good morning. Uh, hope everyone can hear me all right. This is an overview of our agenda for today. Um, we'll go through the introductions, which we've just finished. Um, and I'll inter I'm introducing the agenda. Um, first item we're going to talk about is just a situational overview, uh, what we called the world we live in, just to remind everybody of some of the challenges faced and some of the developments that have occurred over the last several years, um, how things are changing. Then we'll move, I'll, I'll be giving that session, then we'll move on to Robert, who will talk about, uh, give an overview of some of Siemens solutions and approaches to addressing these situations. The uh, third item on the agenda, or topic number four, I guess, is uh, standards and practices, and that will come back to me, and I'll give an overview and an introduction to some of what's going on in the standards community and what the standards community is bringing to the table to help people deal with some of these challenges. Then we'll switch back to Robert to talk about some specific solutions. And then finally, the uh, Q&A session will close the session. Uh, and throughout these, as uh, was already mentioned, as Rob already mentioned, we'll have uh, poll questions at the conclusion of each one of these four major topics. Okay, there we go. So let's start with the world we live in. Just a little graphic down there at the lower left just to give you an idea of the uh, cyber crime now is estimated to be a uh, $1 trillion industry, which is some pretty significant numbers. So let's talk about the situation. What What is it we're facing? And I've broken this down into four general subcategories. 
um, and give it you a little uh, uh, visual here to indicate maybe what's the, what the response and react, general reaction is to each one of these. First of all, risk is evolving continually. Um, we, all, we are constantly seeing new reports of changes in the threat landscape, and, and by risk I'm talking about the function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. So while the threat and the vulnerability change fairly routinely and fairly constantly as new threats evolve and new products are introduced into the market that have new vulnerabilities, and in some cases new vulnerabilities discovered in existing products, the consequence portion of it for in the industrial space remains fairly constant. Uh, we know what our consequences are, consequences of breach and consequences of loss of integrity of our system. So generally, the, uh, given that two out of three of those are changing, I think that uh, people are pretty concerned about that, uh, that aspect of the situation. Moving on to complexity, um, we know that our systems have become much more complex. I've been working in the control system space for decades, and we've come far, uh, you know, very far from when the days of simple control systems that were not connected to anything. Now they're very increasingly connected within themselves and as well to the external systems. And where we are today is that many people are operating control systems, certainly at the plant level, the people operating the control system don't fully even understand all of the complexities that they're dealing with. On the plus side, at least we hope it's on the plus side, we have improving standards. Uh, standards like NERC SIP, standards that have come forward uh, from ISA, um, more specific industry standards are coming coming forward and are now available and give practical guidance on how to secure these systems. But as we all know, the old saying, the problem with standards is we have so many of them. So people are a little puzzled about the situation with respect to standards and not only the, the proliferation of standards of the number available, but also how to apply them because standards can sometimes be very complex and take a lot of time to understand them in order to apply them properly. What helps in that situation is the fourth element on this list, and that's proven practices. Practices and standards are complementary. They go hand in hand. Practices generally help us to understand standards and how to apply them, and in the ideal case, they give us practical examples of proven case studies. It's been uh, a bit of a challenge to get case studies assembled um, and, and have people consent to sharing them widely. But we're working on that, and I'll talk about a little bit about that more in the standards section later in the presentation. But as you can see, we have challenges throughout all of these areas, and uh, this is a uh, not a new problem, and it is not certainly not solved. So there's many challenges that still remain. The next slide here on slide 10, you probably have seen charts like this before. The threat landscape continues to evolve. Um, and as you can see, going all the way back, if you're as old as I am at least, you can remember back into the 1980s and remember when the biggest problem we had was password guessing and then as the emergence of personal computers became more prevalent, um, you saw things, we saw things like uh, pass, or, uh, sorry, uh, virus, viruses released for specific systems or somehow found a way on specific systems. And the, uh, the sophistication of these was fairly low, but as you can see, it's progressed through the years up to the present day. And I'm not going to go through all of these things, but you've seen all the various tools that the, that the uh, adversaries have brought to bear. And now we're dealing with things like ransomware and staged attacks and advanced persistent threats and other things that are uh, up at the top right corner here. So the, the um, attackers have gotten more sophisticated and the consequences in some cases have gotten uh, correspondingly more serious. At the same time, the targets have also evolved. And it, this, there was a hint of this on the previous slide, but this, took, uh, this slide shows that it, back in the early days, in the 80s, um, the focus was largely on individual computers. Your biggest threat, threat was somehow uh, having somebody put a uh, floppy disk into your PC that had a virus on it and the virus, antivirus software evolved to meet that uh, or to address that need and address it fairly effectively. As we started connecting computers together into networks and then finally interconnecting those networks into corporate systems or uh, tying them together to sophisticated corporate systems, the targets, of course, proliferated in the same way. The 
number of targets increased dramatically. And then as we started connecting corporate systems to industrial systems, it, uh, it you know, basically the attack surface, if you use the, the security term, um, got much larger. And then Dow today, we have the, with the emergence of internet, uh, the industrial internet of things or internet of things in general, we have many, many more potentially connected devices and that just makes the problem even more complex. So as I said earlier on the earlier slide, um, we generally think of risk as being a function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence, where consequence has a probability. Actually, all of these have a probability element to them. But uh, if you look at, as I mentioned earlier, the threats are evolving. Vulnerabilities seem ever present. We continue to strive for secure by design, which is, would be software that has no vulnerabilities. But to my knowledge, no one has ever achieved that yet. Um, and then always serious potential consequences, particularly in the industrial space. There are some myths that tend to linger, um, that persist from time to time. And although we try to debunk these myths as best we can, uh, that some of them are still uh, lingering, as I said, and people hold on to these beliefs. First of all, the, the one that I hear consistently is, well, no one would want to attack us. Uh, you know, we're a small plant out in some remote location and we don't have a particularly interesting process and there's no, uh, nothing to be gained by attacking us. That may be true, but it really doesn't matter because as we've seen with attacks like WannaCry, those were not particularly attacked, those kind of attacks were not particularly focused on a specific target. They're released and wherever they happen to hit, then, uh, and that's, you know, that's what happens. And so your sort of collateral damage or non-specific non attacks. So it may not have been directed at you specifically, but you, nonetheless you're affected by it. The other one is, of course, well, it can't happen to us, and this is the uh, emergence of human dial, you know, in the great wide world out there with all the billions of possible targets or billions of possible targets. Um, you know, I'm just going to take my chances and hope that, that, hope that the probability is on my side and it won't happen to me. That's a very risky situation, a very risky to, uh, position to take, as we all know. But as I keep telling people, never underestimate the power of human denial. There's also a tendency to divert responsibility and accountability and say, well, it's all about IT and let them figure it out. And of course, we know that that's not the case in industrial systems. But even when people say that, uh, you know, we, we will address the industrial systems. There is a, sometimes a tendency to think that they can be addressed in the same way as typical business information technology, and that is not, uh, not the case either. And then lastly, under naive K, I'm saying, you know, addressing security, one of the elements of that I see consistently is, well, we think that security is basically a project. It has a beginning and has a defined end. And people will ask, well, okay, we spent a lot of money. Are we done? And the unfortunate fact is you are never done. Security is not a project. Security is a posture. It is a process. And as long as the components of risk continue to evolve, as I've shown in the earlier slides, then you're going to have to continue to evolve your response to it. There's also some naivete saying that we can eliminate all vulnerabilities. As I said earlier, I don't think I've, at least certainly I've not seen anyone that's ever been able to write software that has no vulnerabilities. And the other one, finally, that cybersecurity incidents will not impact operations. And there are all sorts of nuanced and non-specific ways that this can happen. It doesn't have to be a direct in attack on these industrial systems, but as I mentioned, you can be collateral damage to, from a, uh, an attack even within your own company. So I'm not going to go through all of these slides, all of the items on this slide, but you can see the challenges are here, and we do have a Sisyphus-like situation of rolling the rock up the hill. Um, all of these challenges remain and continue to have to be addressed, and it's the kind of thing that uh, keeps our security specialists very busy. So, uh, as you can see, there's, there are lots of things on this list, and this is not an inclusive list by any, any means. And the risks, of course, are evolving. I mentioned security through obscurity, or basically saying nobody is interested in us, and if we keep our head down, you know, we'll be okay. One of the biggest ones is inaccurate or non-existing inventory. 
Um, you can't secure what you don't know. And if you haven't got an accurate picture of what's installed in your facilities, then it's pretty hard to understand what the risks are and then make the necessary mitigating uh, measure, take the necessary mitigating measures to protect them. So very often, particularly in an industrial environment, these inventories are woefully inadequate if they exist at all. And as you can, as a result of that, several of the suppliers in the space are coming forward with tools and methods and processes to help you uh, inventory your assets as the first step. We also have, of course, uh, unpatched or unsupported operating systems, the, the ones that can't be patched are the so-called zero day, or sorry, forever days, because they're always going to be vulnerable because they simply can't be patched. And it, as you read down the list, and again, I'm not going to list all of these or discuss all of these, but you can see that most of these should be fairly familiar to you. Um, I'll just highlight one close to the bottom, which is lack of accountability. It's very, very important. It's even critical to make sure that who you know who in your organization is ultimately accountable for the security of your system. And I don't mean responsibility. I mean accountability. Uh, it's not the person that necessarily has to do the work, but the person who basically uh, has to answer if something goes wrong. Here I'm going to take a, a brief, uh, just a brief few seconds to talk about one view of the market from the ARC advisory group. You may be familiar with them. They are a research and consulting company here in the U.S. And they have recently published a series of market studies on the subject of industrial cybersecurity. And the content of the studies is not so germane to this discussion as the breakdown that they've taken. They quickly decided that it was too much of a challenge and frankly not really practical to try to address the entire space in one market study. So they broke it down into these categories. The actual choice of categories is not so important as it is to just make sure that collectively these categories address the space. The categories they've chosen are anomaly and breach detection, endpoint protection, management solutions, network security, and services. And you can see from the, the brackets at the right here, these are a mix of product and service responses. And collectively, as I said, they pretty much address the, the breadth of the cybersecurity market. So that brings us to poll question number one which it brings us to the end of the first section in the poll question number one. As you can see, the poll here is, do you, looking at your situation today, do you feel that you have the information, the guidance, and services that you need? And your choices are yes, yes, but more is needed, not sure of what works best, and not at all aware of what's available. So we'll take a few minutes, and if you could just enter your responses to the poll, and we'll get a gauge of the, of the position of the audience. Rob, I'll leave it to you to decide when you feel we have a representative sample. Absolutely. We've got about a minute left here. And a good deal of our audience has participated here. A couple people are still getting their answers in. Okay, so it looks like we have some results. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, uh, it looks like the percentage. Here we go. So 37% of our people, we got a pretty good split, actually. 37% uh, say more has the information, but more is needed. And 31% say that uh, they're not sure of what works best. That's fairly typical of the, of the situation as I've seen it in my consulting work. 
Um, 13% say they have the information that they need, so that's, that's encouraging. But we still have 6% uh, that say that they're not aware of what's available. And of course, those don't add up to 100 because we have some people who did not respond. So as I said, that's a fairly typical kind of response. And hopefully we can address some of your, uh, some, some of the concerns of the people, uh, the people on the line here in some of these areas, particularly around awareness of what's available. So with that, let me, um, I can advance to the next slide. Okay. Let me turn it over to uh, Robert, who's going to talk a little bit about Siemens response and, um, and, and what they bring to the table. So Robert, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Um, I think today what's important for everybody to realize is that um, there is no single solution for the problem. Uh, every customer is different. There, every solution is going to be different. There's no cookie cutter solution that we can use for every customer. So Siemens has um, taken a different kind of approach to this whole um, scenario with security. And what we've basically done is we've gone here and looked at how can we protect our production areas from attacks from the outside. The first step we said is that we need to do some kind of plant security. We need to ensure that the plant is secure from outside interference, that there's gates around the uh, the production area, that there's um, cameras, um, some kind of identification to come into the actual area itself. This would be where we start with plant security. The second one would be network security. How are the networks set up? This is something that we need to take a strong look at. Um, is there really a need to have a flat network where everything can communicate with everything else? For the simple reason being that is if something should happen to one device, then access is given to all devices. So we start looking at network security. The next one is system integrity. How am I protecting my end endpoints? Uh, PC-based machines, also my production equipment, my uh, PLCs, um, any type of thing in that, in that area of my network. So this is basically what we look at as defense in depth. Um, once one topic or one solution is not going to be enough to protect your production area. So an antivirus may offer you some protection, but it's not going to be enough to prevent everything. So the more that you do, the better your protection stance will be. So at Plant Security Services at Siemens, we've devised a portfolio based on three major areas. The first area is assessed security. Here we evaluate the security status of an industrial plant to give you a baseline of where you are at that point in time. Where are you strong? Where are you weak? Where do you need to improve? And what can we offer you to improve? The next one is to implement security. Reducing risk by implementing security measures. So this could be something as simple as installing a whitelisting or an antivirus software. Um, configuring user accounts things of this nature. And then we go over to domain, uh, managed security. This is where we're offering services such as industrial security monitoring, actually looking at your system live to see what's going on, trying to prevent anything from happening before it happens. We also realize that for a lot of customers, they realize, you know, I need to do something for security, but I don't have the manpower or I don't know, have the capability to do it myself. This is another place where managed security comes in. For the customer, the device is simply a black box. You tell us what needs to be done, we implement, and we manage it for you. So of course, as I mentioned before, the first um, thing that we talked about is access, access security. And we'll be going into this a little bit later uh, in, into this webinar. But the main goal is just to analyze the threats and vulnerabilities, identify the risks, and recommend countermeasures. When we start talking about implement security, we start very simply with security policy consulting. Are security policies in place? 
This is also a very important thing to realize. Um, a lot of times we see in several locations one username and password for all systems. So obviously if somebody should gain access to this username and password, they would have access to all systems using this. And this is a typical example of a security policy. Password exp expiration dates, password length, password complexity, these are all types of things we take a look at. The next one that we take a look at is network design. With network security consulting, we take a look at your production area and determine whether everything needs to communicate with everything else. Nine times out of 10, it is not necessary for all devices to be able to communicate with each other. So what we like to do is take a look at the production line, production area, and break it down into smaller segments using different IP bands. And if a communication is required between two network segmentations, then we can also realize this using something such as a VPN tunnel with specific rules to prevent all other communication. Of course, we need to take a look at our different zones in the production area. A lot of times you'll have an office network somewhere that's trying to connect down into the production line. Maybe the engineer doesn't want to go down where it's dirty and loud and noisy. Um, maybe it's somebody that just hasn't set up the system right, or the office IT is actually controlling the whole production area as well. So here we have um, cell protection and perimeter networks that we're offering with automation firewalls specifically designed and configured for the automation area. And this is where a lot of times the office IT guys uh, will have their difficulty. As Eric had mentioned before, um, the office IT is more concerned about security and locking everything down and protecting everything. But when you start looking at production, we have to realize that if something's not available, we have downtime. And if we have downtime, we're losing money. So our main focus is keeping the production up and secondary, keeping all of our information confidential. So there's a little bit of a give and take here. But we can see with the automation firewall solution, we have a demilitarized zone, we have a protected zone, and we have an insecure zone. So here we will be placing a firewall and using three different uh, network connections to have all the traffic going through the firewall. Another big one, and a very easy one to implement is, of course, antivirus installation. Now, antivirus may not be the optimal solution, uh, especially if you're running some kind of production where they have no internet access or believe to not have any internet access. Um, we've been partnered with McAfee Antivirus now for several years, and we have, um, of course, um, the full solution and support from McAfee for our production areas. All of our software and systems have been tested um, the software has also been approved for use with all the different Siemens software and solutions that we're currently running. Another thing that we have that we're offering is a whitelisting. Also from McAfee, this is uh, quite different than the antivirus software as it actually needs no internet access to be effective as where an antivirus server uh, software always needs pattern updates. Well, with the whitelisting solution, what we're doing is we're actually approving software that's already installed on the computer. So any software that's installed on the computer basically has a hash code and is allowed to run when it's executed. If a virus should be placed on the machine in some form, either from a USB stick or something like this, then there's obviously no hash code behind the software and the software is prevented from running. So this is where we see a lot of industrial customers really liking the solution because they're able to run it on older systems such as Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 10, um, and as well as different server operating systems. And again, this needs no type of internet connection. Another thing we need to take a look at, patch management. Um, since I'm living and working in Germany, I'll be using German um, numbers to give you kind of an idea of what's going on. 90% of all successful attacks find their way through vulnerabilities which a patch already exists. As I'm sure everybody heard of WannaCry and Petya, non-Petya, these attacks were preventable. Microsoft had delivered patches for these for quite a while.
but the problem was people didn't update their systems. So we're also able to help you in as far as patch management goes. Only 2% of all systems are patched. That's a very, very low number of systems that are constantly up to date. And it's amazing when different systems from different customers, how old the patching is on the machines. So this is a very key point to keep your system secure. We also help you come up with a rollout plan for your patch, patches. Obviously, we don't want to patch everything at once in case something causes a problem. So we come up with something like groups. Here we can see in this slide, we have a group A, B, and C. So the first group A would receive the patches. We'd probably wait a couple of days to ensure that everything worked with no problems. Then we'd roll out to group B. Here again, we would wait a couple of days to ensure that everything's running smoothly. And then we'd finally run out to uh, group C. So with this staggered patch um, implementation, we ensure that we have no downtime. Because these systems are redundant, if one system fails, the other system can continue to run. Another thing that's important to know is that at Siemens, every time Microsoft releases patches, uh, whether it be a security patch or a normal patch from patch day, um, they are all completely tested with all of our systems in our security laboratory. So if we do recognize that a patch causes a system problem with either hardware or software that we provide, we also provide an update to inform the customers that, listen, this patch may cause problems. Please do not install this one patch. And a lot of times, we'll also be able to offer you a workaround. So this brings us to our first poll question from, from my side. And the question is, do you have a successful program for implementing Windows patches on your production systems? A, yes, patches are applied regularly. B, patches are applied, but not regularly. No, I'm not aware whether patches are applied. Or no, what is patch management? So I think Eric will let this run another two minutes. Yep. And then we can take a look at the poll results and see how the results stack up to what I've seen in the past. Okay, so we have some results here. Let me scroll over a little bit so I can see the percentages. So 24% have said yes, patches are applied regularly. Well, that's actually pretty impressive. Um, that's not the results we're usually seeing when we go to visit our customers. Uh, patches are applied, but not regularly. Okay, I'm assuming uh, for the customer, for you that answered B, you probably have some kind of maintenance windows, and that's when you're installing your patches. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, one of the things that um, I always like to recommend to customers, if, if you are doing this, that you have certain maintenance windows where you can only apply your patches, is to take a look at using something like a whitelisting software. Because this can effectively expand your maintenance windows as far as patching goes. Because even if somebody should find a possibility to attack your system, they may not actually be able to execute 
what they need to do because the whitelisting would prevent this. 16% uh, are saying, no, I'm not aware whether patches are applied. Uh, that's kind of alarming. And OK, two said, uh, no, what is patch management? It's the numbers are are pretty much uh, accurate as to what we see in in the in the field. Uh, again, um, I think C would probably be uh, my most concerning uh, request. So if there's anything I can answer as far as those questions from the poll later in the at the end of the webinar, uh, please feel free to ask. So with this, I'll give it over to Eric. All right, thank you. So now we're going to move on to the uh, portion on on standards. Sorry, Eric. Um, evidently, I still have a couple of slides. Okay. Uh, sure. I thought it was. I thought. It, I thought it was kind of short. <laughs> Sorry, right, everybody. Go ahead. Um, what I want to discuss here uh, is some of our managed uh, security services that we're offering you, and. Um, one of them, one of the big things that we're seeing is the growing vulnerability. Um, security incidents are up 51% of all German companies have been affected. Over half of all German companies have been affected by some type of security incident. And the reason we know this is because with the new German regulations, um, companies are required to submit incidents when they happen to the government. So this is kind of a scary number, 51%. If we look at the annual losses, as I mentioned, because I'm living and working in Germany, I'll use Germany for, as an example. We're estimating 51 billion euros are being lost annually on the German economy from some type of cyber attack. Time taken to discover a security incident, and this varies from, from site to site that you go to, is anywhere between 98 to 200 days. So somebody could be in your system actively stealing data or changing data or whatever they may be doing for almost 100 days before they're even discovered, and in some cases even longer. So causes of penetration or unknown causes, roughly 28%. 28% of all cases are just unknown how they've gained access. So what can we do to address these issues? Siemens has a cyber emergency readiness team, or a CERT, directly aimed towards the customers. We have, of course, we have our, an internal CERT, but we also have a customer CERT. And the cyber emergency readiness team is able to offer you um, incident response when something should happen. We also offer continuous end-to-end -end protection. So here we're taking a look at incident handling, which is done by our CERT team, industrial security monitoring based on a McAfee SIEM solution, and using a global threat intelligence database. So with the combination of these three, we have a complete security management system for you. Our industrial security monitoring, or SEAM solution, is a security event and information management. The solution is based on log files. So what happens is all of the log files from your different devices, whether it be PC-based, machine-based, any kind of device that can deliver a log file, are gathered, run through parsing rules and correlations, and then alerts and notifications can be generated. And this is all done using McAfee Seam Solution. Some of the typical monitoring scenarios that we, we see or that we feel are important, changes of configuration. A lot of times production areas are unmonitored, we have a lot of outstations, things of this nature, and it's hard to find when changes have been made to the configuration. Brute force and suspicious user activities. Is it normal for a user to be sending data out of country every morning at 2 a.m.? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but this is something we need to take a look at. 
spreading of malware, new network devices. This is something else. Nine times out of ten, you'll never notice when a new network device has been placed in your network, unless you've got some kind of monitoring scenario. And of course, prohibited or suspicious network connections and network and port scans. Also something that we have coming very soon is a security vulnerability uh, application. This is working off of a Siemens database that collects all vulnerabilities for not only Siemens components, but also Windows, major Windows software and Windows components. So with this, you would be informed when, for example, a new security update for Adobe PDF has been released, or maybe for Java, or Windows has released a new security update for Windows 10. This would all be presented to you so you're informed, you don't have to go searching for the information. This is all something that you can call up in a web browser and see exactly what vulnerabilities are new to your systems and your system specifically. We can also give you information regarding your hardware. If you're running Siemens equipment, we can also tell you that for your PLC, for example, a new security update's been released. So this is all things to try to save you time and keep you um, up to date as quickly as possible. So here's the third poll question, and this is one that's close to my heart. Have you implemented whitelisting in your production environment? Yes, whitelisting is implemented in our production environment. No, whitelisting is important, but we need more information. No, I'm not concerned. Whitelisting will break my production systems. No, we have not implemented whitelisting. What is whitelisting? So I think we'll let this run another two minutes again, and then I'll hand over to Eric after we look at the results. Let's take a quick look at the results. 21% of you have said uh, whitelisting is implementing your production environment. That's fantastic. I'm glad to see that. 24% uh, are saying we need a little bit more information. 10% are saying that you're concerned with it affecting your production systems. And 16% are saying that it's not implemented and they're not quite sure what whitelisting is. Well, that, that's, a, that's about on the average. Um, I'm really impressed with the 21%, though. That, that seems like pretty high, higher than average. Um, and I think, see, um, the concern about breaking the production systems is a general concern that we have with most customers. Um, what we like to offer you is always a proof of concept so we know that, uh, so you can see that it won't affect your system. One of the nice things about whitelisting is it's also um, not as resource dependent as an antivirus is. Um, so we're able to run a whitelisting also on a very um, low end device. So again, if if you want have more questions about uh, whitelisting or you need more information, uh, please feel free to contact me. 
Um, you can also ask in the question and answer session at the end of the, the webinar. Um, so now I know I'm done this time, and I'll hand it over to Eric. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, I'm, for my, my section here, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about standards and practices. I stress that it was just a few minutes because I know that many times this can be a very dry subject. Um, those of us that work in standards and practices and developing standards get very excited about the nuances and the details of the process and then sometimes forget that for most people they don't really care. They, they're only concerned about the, the results. So I'll try to focus on practical, uh, useful knowledge and stay away from the, the details of how the process operates. So, um, okay, I'm going to be advancing slides. Let's try one more time. There we go. Okay, so as I mentioned in my earlier section, we talk about both standards and practices. So I'm going to touch a little bit on each one of those. Um, First of all, standards. Although I, I don't know how, how closely or how often you track the progress of what's going on in the standards area with respect to industrial security, but they are maturing fairly rapidly. And if you were to look at a, a curve, I guess, of, of the rate of uh, maturation, you would probably see it accelerating right about now. It's actually in a, we're in a pretty interesting time with the evolution of standards. The 62443 series, that you may be familiar with that is jointly developed by the uh, International Society for Automation, ISA, and the IEC TC65 Working Group 10 is almost what I would call feature complete. And what do I mean by that? And I'll get into a little bit more detail later, but what I mean is the essential and most important aspects have been addressed in one or more standards that are either published or very soon to be published. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, and I, this is a term that I like to use, is that standards by and large are not really intended to be used by civilians. And so what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is that standards can be pretty arcane and pretty detailed, and sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, very dry and difficult to read. So very often in applying standards, end users or asset owners who don't have the time or necessarily the expertise to really understand all the nuances will need some assistance uh, in, in order to figure out how to apply these standards and how to assess their progress. Some of that assistance comes in the form of product and process certification. So various organizations such as the, the uh, ISA Security Compliance Institute or ISTE has the ISA Secure certification. And I know that in, uh, in Europe, and particularly in Germany, that uh, TUV has some certifications uh, that can be applied to industrial control systems for compliance with standards. The ISA Secure Standards, or ISA Secure Compliance Specification developed by ISTE are available and are being used by several independent test labs, uh, TUV included, in order to do those kind of certifications. So the standards, are, I'll come back to standards in a moment, and particularly 62443, but in the moment, for the time being, let's move on to practices. Mentioned in my earlier remark, practices are, in my opinion at least, as someone who spent many years as an asset owner, working for an asset owner, is really where you get the most important and valuable information because it gives you practical direction and guidance about not what has to be done, which is in the standards, but more importantly, how you should do it and how other people have done it. So the, the important points here are sharing of results, in other words, what worked, what didn't work, or what might have not worked very well. And the delicate portion of this is the sharing of incident information. There have been various attempts by various organizations, both governmental and in the private sector, to collect information about incidents in some form of database that could be used by people to look at history uh, and see what has happened in regard, with regards to specific incidents in terms of impact, uh, loss, and so forth. Unfortunately, most companies 
regard that information as very sensitive, many times will not share it even with their own company, much less outside of their company. So attempts to generate such databases have been uh, difficult and body at best. There is some information available, but most of us are faced with, uh, you know, staying plugged into the coverage of, of incidents as they occur. So let me speak for just a few moments on the 62443 standards. Uh, this is an area that's near and dear to my heart because I've spent pretty much the last 15 years working on this committee and chairing it for the last several years. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the ISA 99 committee, which was formed in 2002, works in collaboration with IEC Technical Committee 65, Working Group 10, to develop the 62443 standards, which are then released by both ISA as U.S. national standards, as well as by IEC as international standards. This picture shows you uh, basically a, a very quick overview of the components of this series, and I'm not going to talk about each one of them. I assume some of you probably have seen this picture before or something like this. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is the four layers. The first section of standards in the series, the so-called one portion or the one series, are aimed at the general audience. So they introduce concepts and models and terminology and so forth. But I wanted to draw your attention to the 1-4 in the top right. This is a uh, technical report that is just beginning to be developed. We have just, the committee has just formed a new work group on this and they're just getting going and their charter is to assemble use cases that illustrate the use of the standards across the security life cycle. So if this is something you're interested in, you feel, feel free to contact me if it, using the contact information that you receive at the end of the webinar. The second tier on policies and practices is addressed and targeted specifically for the end user or the asset owner. And this is where you get information about what constitutes an effective security management system, some specific um, examples and the implementation guidance in 2.2. The 2-3 is a technical report on patch management that has been published uh, and is in the court process of being evaluated to see if it can be converted to a normative standard. And then 2-4 is the one standard in this series that was developed first by IEC and will be adopted by ISA. All of the others have been adopted or developed first by ISA and then will be adopted hopefully by IEC. So 2-4 talks about requirements for solution suppliers and system integrators. Moving on down the chart here, the, the third and fourth tiers are addressed at the suppliers, people who build, develop, um, manufacture, develop and build software and hardware for industrial control systems, such as Siemens and others. And the first, uh, the first of these two, the third tier, the system one, talks about the requirements at a system level. And the um, fourth one talks about requirements at the more detailed level down at the components. And I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of the items here in these two tiers. The um, three dash two in the middle of tier three is recently gone out for vote, the ballot closes in about a week, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get that approved and published fairly quickly. The 3-3 uh, has been published for several years, but going down to the fourth level, 4-1 and 4-2 are also both, uh, have been balloted a couple of times and are very close to uh, being published. So that's a quick overview of 62443. Now, I'm going to, I put this slide in here about the NIST framework. Now, I realize NIST is a U.S. organization. It's a, it's a part of the Department of Commerce of the United States government. And that may have less uh, interest and exposure to our European audience here this morning. But I, I mentioned this solely because I think that NIST, the NIST framework has gotten, well, I think the awareness has spread well beyond the borders of the United States. The most people in this space are at least aware of the framework. There's no uh, reason why anyone in the world could not apply this. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. It gives you a structure within which you can define and assess your cybersecurity response according to these five categories. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. 
And so I'm not going to go into the details. There's a URL there that you can go find all the information you'd ever want to know about this framework. But again, I would encourage you to at least take a look at it. Uh, it's been very widely adopted, and NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, is continuing to work on refining it. And as a matter of fact, last week released a, a uh, manufacturing, what they call it, roadmap or guideline. I can't, I can't remember exactly what they called it, but basically a, an example of the implementation in manufacturing. So this is, this is another resource that if you're not familiar, please take a look at it. So with all of this in mind, and there are many that I did not mention. I did not mention the NERC 6 standards, for example, it's simply in the interest of time, not because they're not important. But there are other things like the NERC 6 standards as well for the energy sector as well as uh, the chemical sector has developed some standards and practices and other sectors as well, and, and more continue to be developed. But in light of all of this, one might ask, well, okay, what else is needed? Well, I think that, and again, this is my view, we need some other perspectives, new perspectives sort of mixed into all of this. And I alluded to asset management in my earlier remarks. If you can't secure, you can't secure what you can't identify. So we have to be able to integrate uh, asset, the asset management need with security. And this is important because it's important to know what you have even for other reasons other than security. So it's important to have an accurate asset inventory. And the good news is, as I mentioned, that various suppliers and vendors and co companies out there are starting both uh, control system companies like Siemens, but also third party companies addressing environments where, they, where you have a mixture of systems from different vendors have uh, products that can help you with this challenge. It's not for me to uh, mention specific companies or endorse specific companies, but I just wanted to let you know that there are things out there, and if you want more detail, you can contact me offline. It's also important to integrate security management and automation system management. Asset management is part of that, but what I mean by this is, and it goes back to the accountability point that I made earlier, you have to emphasize that Ensuring the security of this is part of the accountability of operations and the engineering organizations that support these systems. So to be able to do dynamic system characterization, so as, as configuration changes, that, that uh, you can characterize those system changes on the fly. You also need to be able to detect anomalous behavior. Um, Robert mentioned one example of that earlier, but there are also other examples of behaviors that might not be uh, proper, and you want to be able to detect and respond to those. And then lastly, control systems change all the time and evolve to meet the changing needs, so you have to have a, a rigorous management of change process. Okay, so there we go. So where can you get help in this area? First of all, within your own organizations, if you do not have at this time, an effective partnership between your operations or engineering organization and your IT support group, be they internal or external, I would strongly suggest that you look at doing that. Uh, the days of these groups being adversaries or sort of um, blithely ignoring each other are gone, and uh, we simply can't afford that kind of response anymore. External and in some cases internal uh, stakeholders will have expectations and in some cases even regulations that have to be met. So those are obviously, uh, you might not call them help, but there are influences on your response. I mentioned standards, standards and frameworks already, so I'm not going to elaborate on that and practices and guidance. And then lastly, you can avail yourself of various contract or purchase services from a variety of suppliers. Uh, Robert has already mentioned that uh, Siemens provides some of these capabilities, and there are, are many, many others to choose from. So that brings us to poll question four, and this is to speak to the response to your particular situation. So do you participate in or contribute to an active internal industrial control system cybersecurity program? So your responses are yes, I'm a leader in this area, perhaps one of the people leading the program, or yes, I am a contributing. Third option is no, 
uh, but we are planning such a program, so maybe you're constructing it and laying it out right now. And then the last one is option B, which is no, we have no current plans for such a response. So we'll take about two minutes to respond to this poll, and then I'll turn it over to uh, back to Robert to uh, talk about the last portion of our webinar. All right, it looks like the poll is closed. We're just waiting for the results. Okay, so what do we have here? All right, well, we have uh, five people who are in a leadership role. 8% of our response uh, in a leadership role in their respective programs. That's very encouraging to hear. And an additional 11 people, another 18% that are contributing. So total, that would be uh, basically 16 people that are actively involved in the response in their respective companies. So that's, that's uh, very encouraging. So what is it that the quarter of the people uh, on, on the uh, webinar? A further 16 or 26 percent of people are planning such a program. So again, uh, my I hope my remarks were particularly useful for you because you have many options available to you as you plan such a program, and I would encourage you to take advantage of as many of them as, as you can. Uh, like I said, there's lots of help out there. And then 16 percent or 10 people have no current plans. Now. That is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you can respond or you can uh, react to this situation, um, uh, I guess, situationally uh, without a, a comprehensive program. Depending on the size and sophistication of your company, I wouldn't tend to re recommend that, but it certainly is a, a, valuable, a, a valid option. So with that, uh, let me just get rid of this, and we'll move on to the next portion of the webinar, and final portion of the webinar. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Thanks. So, Go ahead. As I mentioned at the very beginning, um, our first goal was um, that we decided was assess security, to analyze the threats and vulnerability, identify risks, and recommend security measures. I think what's important for everybody to understand is that the assessments that we are offering from Siemens are solely based for the OT environment. We're not taking any kind of look as far as the IT environment goes. So when we do do an assessment of the customer, we're solely looking at the production area. So what type of assessment would you like? And what type of assessments can we, we offer? I need a quick check based on the best known security standards for automation and process control systems. Now, we at Siemens, we've taken the stance that we are going to be focusing on the IEC 62443. And from this assessment, we're using the 3-3, which you saw previously by in Eric's chart, is designed for the automation environment. So this is roughly, I believe, somewhere around 80 questions which will go into greater detail, asking types of questions about switching, about networking, about user accounts, these type of things. And the nice thing that we find about this uh, IEC 62443 assessment is it's based on levels, from level one to level four. So level four would be your top dog. This would be your, your secure against the NSA, against 
the KGB, whoever it may be, this is top level stuff. This is extremely in depth. Then you go down to level three, which is being required by some countries for critical infrastructure. This type of thing, level three, you're being required to use an industrial security monitoring solution or some type of SIEM solution, just to give you a rough idea. Then level two, we're talking more about types of things like two-factor authentication, unique user accounts, this type of thing. And level one is the basic level of security required for production area using the 62443. So depending upon which level the customer decides that they want, we would go through and evaluate all the questions, generate a report at the end, and then give you mitigating factors for say level one, level two, level three, or level four. The important thing about the 62443 to keep in mind is to achieve a security level. You must have a yes to all answers or a not applicable with a foundationable reason why it's not applicable. As soon as you answer one question with a no, you will not achieve that security level. So this is where a, customer, a lot of customers are kind of surprised that when we go and we do their assessments and they think, well, we've been doing a lot of security stuff, we're, we're really tight on our security, and they can't reach level one because one or two questions are answered with a no. It could be very simple things to fix, such as network segmenting or assigning individual user accounts to PCs, something of this nature, which doesn't invo uh, involve a lot of invest from the company itself. So with this, you get a generated report, you know exactly where you're strong, where you're weak, and what you can do to correct these problems. This is the 62443. So the next option you have is a quick check based on best known security standards. And for this, we're using the ISO 27001 assessment. So this assessment has been around for a lot of years. This is something that it was generated originally in the office IT environment, and its main goal is concentrated on policies and procedures. So this isn't as specific to the automation environment. But again, here, you can receive a report from us with all of the mitigating factors, as well as an, a complete listing of where you're strong and where you're weak. The next one option that we have is we'd like a deep dive anal analysis of an industrial environment, including data gathering. To go back to the first two assessments, these first two assessments are what we call compliance assessments. They're all based on questions and answers. So we sit down with you, we ask you these questions, you answer yes, no, or not applicable, and we fill out all the, the, the tools and we can generate the reports and customize them for you at the end. With this next one, the risk and vulnerability assessment that we offer, we're at your location at least a week, and we're actually walking through your production area and discussing different details with your production uh, OT guys, with your office IT guys, with your operators, to actually get a really good feel of what's being done, how well the um, employees have been trained, do they know how to react to an incident if something should happen, and we look at, gather all this information. So on average, we take all this information and we need roughly another week to analyze all this information that we've gathered and then provide you with a report. Again, this report is a little bit different. You also get your highs and lows, so to say, but you also get CVS scores, or CSV scores, excuse me, which will let you know exactly how vulnerable you are based on your situation today. And the goal with all of these assessments, as Eric had mentioned before, if you can't identify it, you can't protect it. And this is where we see a lot of customers, they're coming to us and saying, you know, we know we need to do something, but where do we start? And we always tell them to start with an assessment. And with this assessment, you'll see on paper where your problems are. 
And this also gives you the option of taking this report and then going to management for more funding. Because a lot of times if you can't provide an answer as to where the money is going to be going, you won't get the money. And a lot of times management just won't understand where the problems are until you can show them. One thing I don't have a slide for that I'd like to mention really quick is that we are currently in the process of creating what's called a health check. This will be available online, free of charge, where you can answer roughly 18 to 20 questions and submit the results and you will receive a, a mini report with a stoplight type answer on how your production is protected regarding different areas. So this is something we're, we should be releasing in, in the next couple of months that's looking very interesting for a quick assessment for the customer that doesn't know which assessment they may need or again doesn't know where their status is as of today. So that concludes my presentation from the Siemens side. Um, I hope that we've been able to provide you with some information as to what Siemens is offering, our strategy, our outlook on security. Security for Siemens is a number one priority, Siemens-wide. So this isn't something that's being just done for process automation or factory automation. This is something that's being done Siemens-wide, worldwide, and uh, a heavy emphasis has been placed on it. Because if you take a look, just in retrospect, how much it would cost you if your production stopped for a period of 24 hours and to what it would cost you to implement some security measures to prevent that production stop, it easily outweighs the loss. Not to mention, in certain industries, we have the, life, the loss of life that we also have to take into consideration. So with that, I'd just like to leave you with one closing word, and that's plain and simple. There is no 100% security. There's always somebody out there that's smarter, that's going to find a way through your system, but make it harder for them. Most hackers will leave if they don't get access quickly. So I think that goes back to Rob now. Yes, Robert, thank you. And um, I just want to say thank you to both of our presenters today. And so. Um, now we are going to be moving into the uh, Q&A session of this webinar. So um, everyone will uh, go down to the Q&A box down there on the right side of the WebEx window. That is where you can submit a few questions for our presenters. Um, I'm just uh, getting everything rolled over here. Yes, and of course, as you can see on the screen, we have the uh, information for both of our presenters today. Um, unfortunately, with this many attendees, we can't open up the phones to take those questions live, um, and so that is why we encourage you to uh, to use this tool uh, and this opportunity here to speak with our presenters and uh, get some things answered. Okay, so our first question here, I just got one here, it says, um, what is the best practice on network segmentation and whitelisting in PCS7? Okay, Rob, I think that one's uh, probably toward, aimed towards myself. Um, nope. On As far as PCS7 goes, um, our McAfee whitelisting solution um, has been approved for use with PCS7. It's been system tested. It's been um, tested with versions from 6 or 7.1, I think, up until the current version. So one of the unique things about um, purchasing whitelisting from Siemens is that we are the only provider of the whitelisting software that is able to sell you a version for an um, an outdated system for a legacy system. For example, if you're running uh, Windows XP still in a PCS7 environment and you do not have the whitelisting software already, if you go to any reseller or go to McAfee directly, you will no longer be able to, to purchase this version. But we do have it for you at Siemens. 
So as far as whitelisting goes, um, I would suggest any system over 10 uh, endpoints that we use what's called the ePolicy Orchestrator. This is also free of charge when you purchase the software from Siemens. And this is basically a server version for the application control, so I can control all of my clients. Also with a graphic interface, very simple, straightforward to use. Network segmentation is a little bit more difficult depending upon the production area of what you're using, what you're producing, and how much communication needs to be done with those devices. So a lot of times as far as network segmentation, it's really the production independent. I hope that answers the question, Steve. Um, if you like more information or, or you want contact with somebody from Siemens, just give me a, uh, a call or shoot me an email and I'll make sure I get you the information you need. Uh, this is Eric. If I could add just one comment to that real quickly, uh, particularly on system segmentation. Uh, I mentioned in my overview or update on the 62443 standards, one of the ones I mentioned was 62443-3-2, which is not fully published yet. It's not been completely finished and published yet, but drafts are certainly available. And that standard specifically addresses um, Risk Assessment and System Design is the title, and that gives you a, uh, a thorough description of how to approach your system from the point of view of system segmentation and assignment and security level of each segment. So if you want more information on that, send me an email afterwards and I can uh, switch more. All right, thank you to both of you guys. Um, the next question I have here is, um, it reads, I understand the benefits of segmented networks and firewalled, but do you recommend also a Windows domain dedicated to industrial systems different from the office domain? You want to take that one? This is Eric. Yeah, I'll give you a quick answer. The short answer is yes. Um, we, as a minimum, well, as you know, if you're looking at defining the uh, Active Directory architecture for a company, if the company is any more than a trivial size, that can be a very complex task. And um, I have seen responses or, or approaches all the way from, uh, you know, a single Active Directory for us with, and I, I'm going to get terminology wrong, but basically hardly subdivided at all to uh, Active Directory for us with um, subsections in it, with trust, some level of trust between them, all the way to the other end of the extreme, which is a separate forest for the control system and no trust between it and the enterprise. And I think the answer really lies, the answer for your particular situation lies in that risk assessment step, understanding, um, you know, what risks that you want to protect against and what the potential, what, what threats you want to protect against and what are the possible vulnerabilities and what are the potential consequences. Uh, I know of one large chemical company, for example, that the way they have implemented their control systems is the extreme case that I mentioned, which is a totally separate force and no trust at all. And so I think separate force for control systems is fairly common, and then it's just a question of, what level of trust to establish back to the enterprise. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, the next question I have here is, um, if I have an antivirus software for my OT, do I also need to invest in whitelisting software? I'll take this one, Eric, if you don't mind. No, go ahead, I think that's right up your alley. Um, it, it depends. If you have an antivirus software in your OT that is has some kind of pattern update capability, meaning a pattern update server and a DMZ, something like this, where you're continually getting updates, it is a solution. The problem is, is that an antivirus software is not going to recognize a zero-day virus, a zero-day attack, because until this attack is known, the provider cannot provide a patch update or a pattern update. 
The advantage with whitelisting is that it will block any type of executable file from running on your machine. It will also prevent DLLs from being deleted, from programs being renamed. Anything that is runnable will not be changed or affected. So my answer is always, I like to say or recommend yes. I would put more emphasis on the whitelisting than on the antivirus, in my personal opinion. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Whitelisting works extremely well if you have a fairly um, uh, unchanging uh, uh, deterministic environment. So if you know your environment well, you know what's supposed to be running, and anything else by default is not supposed to be running, then, then whitelisting works very well. All right. Thank you both uh, again. Um, another question I have here is, um, uh, what are your experiences with patches on existing running applications? We have customers and colleagues who do not dare to run an update because they are scared the application will not run properly. Uh, this is Eric. I'll give a quick answer to that. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to have some sort of test lab or test facility, then that's, that's the ideal way to do it, uh, is to have those patches checked against your specific configuration, recognizing that suppliers have already checked them to make sure that they don't have any, um, you know, terrible consequences for their system. So that's one level of check. Uh, actually, there's three levels of check. Patches are checked by the people that issue them, and then the suppliers like Siemens and other control system companies will check them against their particular products. But the third and sort of final line of defense is to for you to check them against your specific configuration. And if you have a lab environment to do that, that's obviously ideal. If you don't have a lab or if you have such a diversity of different systems that you can't possibly represent them all in a lab, then you're right, that's a, that's a bit of a problematic situation. But even in situations like that in a plant, you might be able to take, say, one component of the control system, one HMI or something offline and test it on that and then satisfy yourself that it doesn't have any negative consequences before uh, spreading it further. And that's where Robert's approach of hearing your systems or putting them in groups makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just to touch on that um, real quick, is that this is one of the reasons we, we do this tier type um, patch rollout, is that um, a lot of our customers are process automation customers, and it's things like uh, oil and gas, wastewater, uh, this type of thing, and they're required to save their data for up to 10 years or longer. So nine times out of 10, they're always running redundant systems. So we'll run out, we'll roll out patches to one half of the system, and if something should go wrong, they always have their backup still running. So they can roll back. Another thing that I always recommend is that if possible, if it's been a long period of time before you've rolled out patches, Think about doing a backup of your system before you install those patches. Just to be on the safe side that if something does go wrong, you can always roll back to your latest image. Okay, great. Um, the next question I have here is, uh, I have seen numerous architectures addressing cybersecurity and not all of them seem to agree with each other. For example, some place all servers in a DMZ and clients outside the DMZ. The reference architectures in IEC 62443 are not as much detailed as well. Um, do you have any detailed reference architectures? Well, let me, uh, this is Eric, let me address the 62443 aspect of that quickly. Uh, as you might imagine, it's very difficult for us in a standard to come up with detailed architectures that would meet every possible circumstance. So we try to uh, give examples and, and uh, interpretations that are a typical, sort of typical configuration, and then leave it as an exercise to, for the people using the standards developing practices to come up with more specific ones for a particular industry or sector or situation. Uh, as 
far as the DMZ part of it is concerned, uh, again, there are opinions on this like there are opinions on anything else. And I think, though, in general, most people limit the, the placement of clients in the DMZ to those clients that are necessary to manage the elements of the DMZ. So, the, you know, the demilitarized zone is intended to be that, that place that is at some level of trust on both sides, but not too much trust. It's, it's a, an arbiter, if you will, of, of data going back and forth. Robert, I don't know if you have a thought on this. No, I, again, I think Eric touched on it. It's, it's basically customer to customer specific. Um, we do have example um, architectures at Siemens um, referencing basically PCS7, our process automation software, and our tendency is to put anything that's server-based in the DMZ and keep the clients outside of the DMZ. Um, just for the simple fact is that we have a lot of customers using remote access, using jump hosts, using Visa servers, using pattern update servers, this type of thing. So in general, we usually have a fairly large DMZ zone to prevent that kind of interaction with the op actual operating system. One other comment that I'll make real quick is, uh, real quickly is, you'll recall that I mentioned one of the documents we're working on in the committee is the one looking at use cases across the life cycle. This is what one of the uh, reasons that we created that that document in the series, and it's just the, the effort to get that put together is just beginning. So we don't really have anything to offer at this time. But the vision, my vision for that document, is to present some of those representative examples. And again, it won't be the definitive answer, but it'll be just. Uh, examples of things that work. All right, thank you both. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I, I think we can probably um, knock out a couple other questions. Um, one that I see here, which would probably be a good opportunity for a, kind of a good recommendation on this, is that there are many antivirus softwares that are freeware, but seemingly good performance. Is it absolutely necessary to use paid antivirus software? Um, I'll address that from my point of view. Um, as far as um, Siemens software and hardware goes, um, I would say yes, for one simple reason, is that when we release new products, whether it be software or hardware, we're always testing with um, certain software vendors. For example, Symantec, McAfee, Trend Micro, um, there's one from, from China, um, Security 360 or something like this. And we always give the latest version, um, the compatibility is always, a, always an issue. And the reason being is that with our, we'll take PCS7 again as an example. PCS7 looks into its folder structure from time to time to ensure that everything is still located where it's supposed to be and that the files haven't changed. And if an antivirus software has a false negative and it actually deletes one of those files, the PCS7 software will no longer run. So this is why we take a great deal of care into selecting which um, antivirus solutions that we offer. And we have other software such as uh, TIA Portal, a programming software for um, factory automation or for our newer generation systems. Um, for example, we do we did have, or we do have the um, the possibility of using Microsoft Defender, for example. So this is also a, a free free version that's with almost every new Windows client that's installed. So depending on the software, and depending upon um, what you're using it for, would depend on whether you want to use a freeware or not. I personally have had bad experience with freeware antivirus. Yeah, this, uh, this is Eric again real quickly. I don't think the question is, uh, I don't want to change the person's question, but I think you, I would suggest that you think of it in a slightly different way. Uh, regardless of whether it's free or paid, that what you need to focus on is whether it's tested and um, validated or not. And ultimately, that's the decision that should drive your actions. You can find if the vendor in question, be it Siemens or someone else, 
is willing to allow uh, or has tested and, and validated a free software package like Defender or something else, then uh, by all means. I don't think free systems are inherently worse than paid for ones. I've had, I've had, had experience, personal experiences with, with both paid for and free antivirus. I think the, what you need to focus on is whether it's been tested or validated. All right. Well, thank you to both of you, and um, thank you for everybody that participated. These have been some great questions. Um, as noted there on the screen, if we missed your question or if you would like to discuss any of these topics um, in more depth with either of these presenters, please feel free to contact them directly. Their information is right there on the screen. So if you missed any portion of this webinar or if you would like to watch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording along with some additional links with supporting information. So be on the lookout for an email from me in the next couple of days. As a reminder, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. Please take a few minutes to fill out this survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. This concludes the Cybersecurity for Control Systems and Process Automation webinar. Thank you for attending. We hope you acquired some useful information and look forward to seeing you again at one of our future webinars.